Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Queens of Our Past podcast. As always, I'm your host Kirsten, and today we'll be continuing on with the life of Queen Christina of Sweden. So last episode we left off with the abdication of Christina in favor of her cousin Charles Gustav. At this point, she was just 27, but had been on the throne for most of her life. In 1655, she finally achieved her goal of converting to Catholicism on November 3rd. She later entered Rome with an entourage of 255 that I guess she accrued along the way in December, and she was received by Pope Alexander VII and was christened Christina Alexandra. Though it's believed she chose the name because of her admiration of Alexander the Great, I wonder if it was also in honor of the Pope. While in Rome, she was given an entire wing of the Pope's palace to use, which had been designed and furnished by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, one of the loves of my life. She and Bernini became lifelong friends, which I am very jealous of. (laughs) She settled peacefully into a life in the papal-run states of Rome. She occupied apartments in the Palazzo Farnese, where she lived with the Duke of Parma as an honored guest. She opened an academy while living there, called the Academy of Arcadia, where poetry, philosophy, art, music, and theater could be discussed. In the 18th century, this group setting of intellectuals would be called a salon. Later on, she did start an academy, which sounded more like what we would today consider a university. So I think that this was mostly a name that was supposed to stimulate learning and not to be like, this is a higher education. (laughs) So people were shocked by her blasé attitude towards men. Women of this time, as for hundreds of years before and after, were meant to be seen, not heard, unless spoken to. Christina was completely comfortable in the presence of men, which makes sense. She was practically raised by a man. Her father had been wonderfully attentive, bonding with her and seeing her potential even upon birth. Then her tutors, both of which became pseudo-fathers, guided her through all decisions with understanding and patience. It only makes sense that she would be able to make attachments with men easily. So, yeah. In 1656, Christina fell in love with the man who would sustain her need for a companion for the rest of her life. Or at least that's what many people think. Cardinal Decchio Azzanino, she fell in love with him, and he was only a few years older than her, and he was intelligent in ways that eluded Christina. He was a skilled cryptographer and extremely proficient in math. He had a doctorate in law, theology, and philosophy, the latter of which Christina had 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 an interest in since she was a child. He had also been the Papal States ambassador in Spain. It seems that he reciprocated her feelings, but unlike many men of the cloth, he was devoted to remaining celibate for the entirety of his life, which honestly probably kept their passion going. We always want what we can't have. But there are some people who believe that the Cardinal did have sexual affairs with women, and though Christina would tease him about other women he spent time with, I don't see this as being true. He likely would have consummated his relationship with the former queen. Yes, it would be risky, but why not have your cake and eat it too? Some historians postulate that Azzolino had no feelings for Christina and considered her a close friend only, but I think that's a crock of shit. My main reason for thinking this is that he had spent so much time with her that the Pope actually asked them to cool down their relationship in the early years because they were attracting too much attention. That's a big deal. If you look into history, I guarantee you more than three quarters of the Catholic officials at the time, meaning cardinals, bishops, and popes, had mistresses in unthinkable numbers of illegitimate children, and they would get away with it. If the Pope took notice of their relationship and made them tone it down, they were fooling nobody. They apparently spent all hours of the day together, even spending nights talking about their shared interest. Another reason is that the Cardinal spent the last days of his death before burning hundreds of his correspondences, many of which were between him and Christina. Others historians say that they didn't have a relationship because Christina wasn't particularly attractive, and that's just rude. Have they heard that beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Also, as we've discussed in part one, Christina had no problems in the romance department. She'd had many lovers, male and female, a few of which I didn't mention for the sake of time, but she'd had a healthy sexual appetite and sexual relationships since she was at least 18. 
By all accounts, if she wasn't a great beauty, she was alluring in a manner that made her accessible to many different types of people. She obviously had relationships with people. She flaunted them. She was very happy in her relationships. So I just don't agree with that. But let's go on with their relationship. Azzolino and Christina seem to have fulfilled their need for each other through writing letters. Though hers are always more intense and his more prudish, they both clearly state their affection for each other. They would also write passages in code. This was to ensure that if a letter was intercepted, its most sensitive information couldn't be translated. In an intense letter from Christina, she says that their devotion to God does not prevent me from loving you until death. And since piety relieves you from being my lover, then I relieve you from being my servant, for I shall live and die as your slave. Swoon, right? I mean, Christina really knew how to speak talk. After a few years in Rome, she realized that the strict life of living as a Catholic in Rome didn't suit her as well as she thought it would. On top of this, Sweden had ceased sending her revenue due to this conversion. In badass fashion, Christina refused to conform to the rules of Roman society, which isn't surprising, as she cannot be considered normal in any expectations set at the time. She behaved in her typical brash manner, and this turned many people off to her especially the Spanish, whom she wasn't on good terms with during her time on the throne. Because of her waning influence and poor financial situation, she went forward with a plan to seize the kingdom of Naples from Spain with the help of France and its king, Louis XIV, and she would govern it as queen until her death, upon which she would grant it to France. Everything was going very well. She was received at the French court, and while people thought she was odd and mannish, they actually seemed to be fascinated by her and enjoy her company until a horrible mistake on Christina's part. Christina had been staying in private apartments in the palace of Fontainebleau, where for a few months she had suspected her master of the horse, Gian Rinaldo Monodeschi, of sharing her plans with the Pope and other factions that would put these plans in trouble. She had correspondences seized and her suspicions were proved to be correct. She shared these letters with a priest, Lebel, who kept them for a while while she gathered the courage to confront Monodeschi. Christina had him brought to her apartments, where she told him that she knew of his betrayal. Monadeski said that he should be executed for his actions, but I'm pretty sure that he thought he would get a trial and the queen would show him mercy for acknowledging his errors. I can't imagine that he would foresee what would happen to him. So, turns out, Christina took this as him saying, Yo, I'm horrible, please kill me and she called for Labelle to come and hear his last confession within the hour. The priest and Monaldeski were both horrified when they realized that she really meant to kill him and begged for his life to be spared. Monaldeski was stabbed several times in the neck and stomach, and because he was wearing a coat of mail under his clothes, he was protected enough that he was chased into the next room before being finished off. Monodeski was buried in the church of Fontainebleau, and Christina asked for several masses to be said for his soul, which hardly excuses her for the heinous action. She was apparently very sorry that he had to die, but he had confessed and justice had to be served. Some people at the time believed Monodeski was Christina's lover, and there may be some evidence of this, but I didn't find anything that was tangible. Christina seemed to have been very open romantically. The only lover she ever felt spurned by was Magnus, and she sent him away, later forgiving him, then simply stopped paying the debts he accrued. The only notable person she had executed was a pamphlet maker who wrote degrading things about her. Though that isn't something that she that should be looked over, these were quickly forgotten by foreigners, though Sweden was another story. People postulate today that the letters Christina gave to Labelle were romantic in nature, but they don't survive to confirm this, and he kept them for the rest of his life. Pope Alexander, upon hearing this, immediately took her rooms in the Vatican from her possession. She was no longer welcome to visit His Holiness. Louis XIV was much more lax in his assessment of the situation and visited her, visited her shortly after without mentioning the incident. I really don't know why he was like, yo, you can totally kill somebody in my, ha- in my house and I won't fight you, but she remained in the palace as no other country wished that she visit. She knew that she really wasn't welcome in France anymore, but she didn't know what she should do. Louis XIV wasn't pressing her, and but the court was. She tried to go to England, but Cromwell denied her entry. And meanwhile, Anne of Austria, 
the King of France's mother was desperate to have her removed from the land her son ruled. She believed more and more that Christina was a barbarian in a land of civilized people that would just cause problems, and Christina left shortly after. As always, Azzolino was there for her when her reputation was in shambles. He helped her regain her dignity, rebuild her self-esteem, and console her in her failure. I don't want to make it seem that I sympathize with Christina. I do think that this was one of the worst political and social decisions she ever made in her life. She regretted her decision on the basis that it created a divide between her and other European big shots that otherwise might have been integral to her success in becoming the Queen of Naples. She was hurt that people didn't understand why she had to do it. In Sweden, people wouldn't have blinked at this action, but she had to come to terms with the fact that she no longer had power that she had once did. She wasn't a queen, she was broke, and only had her lineage to fall back on. She was truly alone. She had been betrayed by someone she had counted on to help her, and it probably brought back painful feelings involving her mother and the loss of her father and other trauma that occurred in childhood and adolescence. With nowhere else to go, she returned to Rome. Molnodeschi was an Italian noble, so her appearance was not really appreciated, and the Pope refused to see her, saying she was a woman born of a barbarian, barbarously brought up and living with barbarous thoughts, with a ferocious and almost intolerable pride. She wasn't the favorite anymore. So it's safe to say she was no longer welcome in his presence. She stayed with several cardinals and ended up in the Palazzo Riario, which will be home base for her for the rest of her life. She decorated her new home with works of Grimaldi and Venetian artists, with almost no northern artists except for Rubens, Van Dyck, and Holbein. She had little religious subject matter, instead preferring to have portraits of her friends such as Alonzo Azzolino, Ebba Spar, Bordalo, and Bernini. In 1660, her cousin and heir, Charles X Gustav, died and she made the decision to return to Sweden, as his son, Charles, was only five years old. She came in with statements about how she had only given the throne to her cousin and his descendants, so if Charles XI died, she had claim to the throne, which, of course, is unnerving for the Swedish court. This was a time where killing for power was still a thing, so her departure was very much anticipated. In any case, she wasn't eligible for the throne anyways. She was a Catholic, and the Lutheran Church made it a point not to allow her to practice while she was in Sweden. Christina eventually agreed to renounce the throne for a second time, whereupon she was given a healthy amount of money. She spent a year in Hamburg, Germany, to get her finances in order for her return to Rome. After two years of traveling in 1662, she went back to the Palazzo Riario, and life went on along nicely, though Ebba died sometime that year. In 1666, there are a lot of confusing events that occurred in quick succession, first of which is that Christina decided to return to Sweden upon hearing allegations and complaints about her, of which I have no idea were about, and I can't find anything, but then again, I'm only doing a cursory overview of her life, and what I think happened is that she was appealing to Charles the Eleventh for control of Poland on top of allegations and complaints, although she'd pretty much had that her whole life, so I don't know where she's coming out with that. She wasn't allowed to go far into Sweden, but she was told she could li- she could live in Swedish Pomerania if she wanted, but she said, "Fuck that," and went back to Hamburg. <laughs> It's important to remember that Christina was living well beyond her means at this point. She had little income from Sweden and other sources, and she was in dire straits for cash. And I think the only way she knew how to get it was to rule a country. Which isn't that relatable. In May of 1667, Pope Alexander VII died, and she was quick to make friends with the new Pope, Clement IX, who visited her palazzo often. In 1668, she wrote a manifesto on the Jews of Rome and against their persecution. This is a reminder of her religious tolerance. Many people in history claim that they are tolerant of religions, but usually they just mean branches branches of the Christian church. They don't include Jews, Muslims, pagans, or anything of the like. So, to hear her say 
that all Jews in Rome were under her protection was monumental in history. She recognized that Jews have gotten the short end of the stick for most of history, and she wanted to make sure that that would not happen while she was in Rome. And she signed her manifesto with La Regina, or the Queen. She also installed an observatory in her palace at the time so she could study astronomy, along with two living astronomers for her palace. It starts becoming apparent that Christina feels ignored by Azzolino, or at the very least, unloved. She expressed hurt in her letters to him that he no longer wrote to her with the same passion, and tries to bring him back to her, saying things like, you have unlimited power over me. In the years of 1669 to 1675, Christina sponsored archaeological digs, she began writing her maxims or memoirs, which would be finished in, 18, in 1681. She also employed actors and opened a successful theater known for both of its, its quality and scandalous performances. She started a real academy for philosophy and literature and continued to sp- sponsor artistic events. She helped to open the first public opera house in Rome, and her palace was considered to be the cultural and intellectual center of the Papal States. For me, I really think that it was her later life, her later years that she flourished and really became a queen. Christina began, began a personal life defined by quietism. Though she enjoyed cultivating a world of culture and higher learning and extravagance outside of her personal life, she decided to live a more serious and meditative existence. It was inspired by the publication of Miguel Molino's Spiritual Guide. Though she maintained her faith, she distanced herself when it came out that he had many sexual affairs a few years later. Pope Innocent the Eleventh may have closed her theaters, but she continued to be a patroness of the arts. She supported her friend Bernini when he was criticized and started to emulate the saints Catherine of Siena and Catherine of Genoa. In 1685, Christina paid for 100 singers and a 150-piece orchestra to write a piece for the coronation of King James II of England, since he identified as a Catholic, even though she was still in need of money. Not much happened between this time and her death. She continued to sport the arts and sciences. But in February of 1689, Christina became ill from complications with diabetes, and received her last rites, though she recovered. She had a relapse and became ill again in April with a streptococcal infection, soon contracting pneumonia with a high fever. She knew she was on her deathbed and began asking forgiveness from people she believed she had wronged, including Pope Innocent. On the morning of April 19th, at the age of 63, with Azzolino by her side, Christina Alexandra, former Queen of Sweden, died in the palace of Corsini. She was buried in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the center of the Catholic religion. A month later, Azzolino died himself. Veronica Buckley, a biographer of the former queen, said Christina was painted a lesbian, a prostitute, a hermaphrodite, and an atheist by her contemporaries, though in that tumultuous age, it is hard to determine which was the most damning label. I want to share with you a painting done between 1670 to 75, a portrait of Christina in her early 40s, done by Jacob Ferdinand Voe. In this, she is the epitome of grace and queenly dignity, but also hardship. Her chestnut hair is cut up in a dramatic coiffure with, pur- with pearls and ribbons, and she is draped with a royal blue cape. Her pearl earrings and lace depict her wealth, though non-existent as we know, and a connoisseurship of contemporary fashion. Her large eyes look out to someone or something to the side of the artist, and her face is tired. She's not the thin girl she once was. People outside of history look at her as an androgynous genius who took life by the balls, but this is wrong. Christina had almost everything against her from birth. Her gender, her relationship with her mother, the loss of her father, her sexuality, her gender, her situation she was born in, the age she was born in. She had a hard life. She made decisions that cost her countries, friendships, and true love. She was betrayed by love since her birth, yet continued to find beauty in people, the written word, in art, and in life. 
If something happened to foil her plans that would break any other person, she moved on to the next thing that could work. She wasn't a genius, but shrewd and forward-thinking. I ask you to look at her whole life, dear listeners, and consider the depictions of Christina in her youth that capture her spirit before it was damaged by disappointment, when she was handed almost every privilege. But this painting shows her as the mature, experienced woman she became. Though she has had enough scandals and tragedies for three lifetimes, she looks like she could break into a smile at any moment. In this portrait, she has never looked more radiant.